Hello. Welcome to a what if counterfactual exploration of what could have changed to change the events of the early part of the invasion of Norway in early April 1940. Uh, <clears throat> it's going to be counterfactual, which means that the vast majority of this is actually going to be uh, history. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Um, my little video may well bounce around a bit according to uh, where it fits on the slides and things. I might also disappear at times. Uh, I hope it doesn't get too unpleasant, but I have uh, production values of nil. So, yeah. So my rules around all of this are any changes need to be explained. I need to try and avoid the use of my own foreknowledge of things. If I take a particular line of alternating things, then I need to acknowledge what else could have happened and what happened in real life and real history. Um, I need to remember that the opposition aren't idiots, unless they are in real history. Um, looking at you, dictatorships of the uh, late 30s, early 40s. Mm-hmm, looking at you. Um, and the other key things are, it's made up. Well, the history isn't, but you know what I mean. So if somebody disagrees with what I'm saying, if somebody disagrees with me, or my assumptions, or my ideas, um, fine. It, it's nothing to take personal. This this isn't, you know, in fact, I want feedback because that's how I can explore my ideas. Um, the other thing is that we want to remember that this is history and this is kind of military history. People died. People were maimed. People suffered permanent lasting injuries. Um, we can make jokes, we can do things like that, but one of the key reasons for doing any, all of this, is to try and avoid repeating mistakes from the past where we could actually learn something. So, you know, be, be reasonably respectful about these sorts of things. Um, it's probably always okay to punch a Nazi, but I'm not sure. I've, I've tried to think of a time when it wouldn't be, uh, but I can't really. Um, so this scenario, what's happened, what's happening. Right. Um, it's kind of a highlight just to briefly set the scene of, because this is a weird time. Um, so in Europe, World War II breaks out September 1939, Germany invades Poland. Britain and France declare war uh, to support their Polish allies. Uh, don't really do anything of any use for the Poles. Uh, then a couple of weeks into the invasion of Poland by the Germans, the Soviet Union joins in. Not a good time to be Polish. Um, but the Allies don't declare war on them. Hmm. You then get what's termed the phony war in that nothing happens on the Western Front, basically. Um, but it's not phony elsewhere by any stretch of the imagination. So on the 17th of September, HMS Courageous is sunk uh, as one of the big fleet carriers of the RN. And HMS Royal Oak, who, which is a... Uh, quite heavily modernised of one of the R-class battleships is sunk in Scarpa Flow on the 14th of October. Both of these are also with quite significant loss of life. Um, you then get uh, USSR invading uh, Finland on the 30th of November. 
the Allies want to help, but don't. Um, they're even more useless from the point of view of the Finns than the um, than they were for the Poles. Uh, Germany remains firmly neutral, uh, so as to not break their agreements with the Soviet Union, um, but will eventually become an ally of the Finns on that kind of the enemy of my enemy is at least the enemy of my enemy and might send me supplies and things um, when the Winter War kicks off again. Um, the Kriegsmarine uh, got really shafted. Um, there are quite a number of people out there on the internet and on YouTube who will say it better than me that naval strategy is a built strategy. Building ships and building the experienced crews to man them takes time uh, and the Kriegsmarine really didn't get that. So they started World War II with 57 u boater I probably said that wrong. And many of those are the smaller Type 2s, which my um, PowerPoint has decided to autocorrect to E because it's irritating. And from September to March, uh, 17 u boater were sunk. Uh, I haven't dredged up the numbers on how many were brought into service though, sorry. Um, Lutzo, having been rapidly renamed from Deutschland to avoid Deutschland being sunk, or risking being sunk, had had a relatively unsuccessful first sortie uh, in the Atlantic, having actually set sail in August and broken into the Atlantic before they had to break into the Atlantic, so when they were still at peace. Um, and but had returned to Germany in November 1939, having only sunk and captured, I think, three ships. Whereas the Graf Spee had had a much more successful outing until uh, getting bottled up in, well, until the Battle of the River Plate and then uh, being scuttled because she could not win. Uh, in December of 1939. Um, the number of ships that are scuttled when you actually look at things is quite interesting. Um, but I think it still always counts as a kill for the other side. Um, it's a recognition that your ship is not going to get away. Um, but you are denying the enemy uh, the opportunity to get on board and salvage stuff and, you know, grab intelligence and things. So, uh, we're now kind of approaching my point of divergence, so warning. Um, it's now latish in March 1940. Uh, there's a popular opinion domestically and among key neutral allies on key neutral countries for the Allies, looking at you, USA, that believe that there's a phony war at least. Um, and really, on the Allied side, they've done nothing since the invasions in Central Europe, um, Poland, and now, with the in retrospect, having seen what's happened, they can include Czechoslovakia and Austria possibly, uh, as well in the things they've failed to actually do anything about. And they've also, by now, completely failed to intervene in the Winter War, which is now over with a Russian victory that was a lot harder than everyone thought it would be, except possibly the Finns. Um, well done, Finland. Um, now, you then get uh, 28th of March 1940, the Allied Supreme War Council meets in London. It's only the sixth meeting like this since the start of the war. They really haven't learnt from the things that won in 1918. 
about centralizing command and about having decisiveness, but never mind. So the French government have been playing musical government as they do in the 1930s and things. Um, and it's now Paul Reynaud's turn to be prime minister instead of replacing Daladier a week or so before this meeting. But Daladier is still the Minister of Defence and is not invited. Um, the French uh, want to bomb Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus, which are supplying the Germans. The British say, no, we haven't beaten one enemy yet. Why create a second one? The British want to uh, conduct a couple of mine warfare operations, let's face it. Churchill wants to conduct a couple of mine warfare operations because he's been turned down from his plan to invade the Baltic. Because um, he's first lord at the Admiralty um, at the moment. So his ideas are Operation Wilfred, which is mining Norwegian waters to try and force the uh, ships carrying iron ore to Germany from Sweden, and I'll come on to this, uh, out into international waters where they can be sunk. And they also want to dump a lot of mines into the River Rhine and disrupt German internal waterway traffic for industry and things. Um, I've actually done a separate video on that as a sort of what if because it didn't quite go as planned. Um, so the uh, problem. Again, we are warning, we are approaching the point of divergence. Warning, warning. So then Deladier. So the French politics being what they are at the time, I genuinely don't know whether Deladier led the French cabinet to retract their approval for the Operation Royal Marine that had been given on the 28th. Due to a genuine concern about the plan or the consequences, there was fear that the Germans might retaliate to the mining of their internal waterways, um, which is shocking because it's not like they were at war. <sighs> Churchill went over to France um, to go and try and sell them on the merits of the mining plan, and somehow the two sets of mining plans had got um, conflated. The idea being that um, the mining in the German waters, German rivers, would distract attention from the minor breach of neutral Norway's territorial waters by planting mines there. Um, so, but whilst he was away, Operation Wilfred, the planting mines in uh, Norwegian waters, which had still been approved by the French, we think, we're not sure. Um, I'm certainly not going to be able to read the primary sources from the French, um, was kind of put on hold by a little bit. So it'd been scheduled to start on about the 5th. Um, it was pushed back by a couple of days. So Op Wilfred will kind of go with W Day. They didn't really have a day like that. It was now postponed to the 8th of April. One of the issues being that um, international law says that you have to give warning of any mining operations and then say where you've placed your mines, um, which actually helps with the uh, efforts to use mines for disruption purposes. And uh, so, it, yeah, it was postponed. Uh, to give notice to the uh, Norwegians, the Swedes, the Danes, um, and just, you know, an international, you know, a warning to shipping. Um, we're putting explosives in the water. Um, yeah. Um, now, knowing the provocative nature of the operation, they'd planned to have the kind of cover of a much more obviously directly against Germany attack, but um, they had a supporting plan for this, which was um, didn't get quite such a good name. 
it was to kind of seize some of the German port, the, the, the Norwegian ports, if the Germans started trying to intervene directly in Norway. And I think there's probably a chance, although it wasn't really explicit, that in the event that the Norwegians appeared to forget who the goodies were, um, they might go in and politely remind the Norwegians that they were friends with the Allies. I don't understand the logic of that one either. Um, but, you know, there were frequent convoys going across the North Sea. There was quite a heavy trade between um, Britain and Norway at this point. Um, uh, it was minerals, so uh, coal going from Scotland and various ore, mineral, you know, metal ores coming across to um, Britain. Um, the plan for these kind of supporting landings and things was called R4, which is very boring. I have seen it referred to as Rupert, so maybe that's a bit more interesting. Can I take your pick? Uh, so all about the iron. Um, so the idea had been that there was, well, there were kind of a couple of plans. There was fighty, warry things happening over here in Finland, Soviet Union and things, which was getting a little bit close to Norway, but didn't actually really affect them. So that was all all badness happening. Um, and what had been happening is Germany, certainly pre-war, was importing about a third of their iron ore from these bits of northern Sweden uh, in Lapland which would then be shipped from Lul Lulia, Lulea, I don't know, um, down through the Baltic to Germany, which was all well and good and not a great deal the Allies could do about that. But Lulia is a port that freezes. So during the winter months, uh, the iron ore coming from around here they used a train and they would cross the border into Norway, go to Narvik, which is a uh, an ice free port. Something to do with islands and tides means that the water is never still enough, apparently. And then the shipping would go down this coast um, to come down the out through the north around the North Sea, which, of course, is something which the British really can do something about. Um, now the problem was that the Germans tended to do it in stay in Norwegian war the, the transport stayed in Norwegian territorial waters and so there's a very limited window to intervene. Now whilst that had been shown not to actually bother some people in the Royal Navy like in the Altmark incident which did feed into this but I won't really talk about any more than that. Um, the plot, the idea was to lay minefields to push the ship, these the shipping out into open, more open North Sea, where they could be intercepted, and either captured, sunk, or whatever. Um, so we're talking. It's really difficult to say. I mean, it it becomes questionable as to whether this was worth it. Uh, by which I mean. And this is Churchill's cunning plan about the minefields. So uh, the idea is to you pl make, make plant two real minefields and one fake minefield. I think the fake minefield is just to distract any mine sweeping efforts. And one is going to be here, and that's called WV, and that's off Vestfjorden, which is the kind of approach to Narvik. Um, those things just around it uh, up here are the Lofoten Islands, if you ever hear about that, them. And then the other, and so that would, I guess, make life harder around there. I'm not sure if it would actually force them out. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and then further down, you've got uh, these two other minefields. Well, the, the real minefield, uh, WS, which is off the Stadlandet, and uh, the fake one, which is WB, which will be off the Bud Headland, which is just near there. Um, and 
yeah, so the idea would be that this is a time when territorial waters normally were only three miles. Um, and yeah, just to say so, Narvik is up here. So Lulia would be around here. There's a train that goes wee. Um, and the fun thing is, all of this is happening to try and keep the Swedish iron ore going to Germany or stopping it. But part of the fun of that is the German, if you invaded Sweden, it would be really easy for the Swedes to just close the mines. So what you what Germany needed to do was to keep them as sort of semi friends so that they could um, buy the ore and then get access to it. So they didn't want to invade Sweden. They want but they did want to have that control of Norway. And they invaded Denmark basically to get air bases nearer to Norway. Um, sorry, Denmark, you have lots and lots of brilliant, brilliant things. Um, but for the purposes of this, um, almost literally a stepping stone. Oh, well. Um, now, this was Churchill's genius idea. Apparently, he chose the name Wilfred because it seemed so boring and innocuous. Um, and the good part of this is it would allow interception of a vital war material for Germany in a place that's convenient for the British. And it plays the British strengths. Um, because Germany's getting its oil from Russia. It's um, getting food, I guess, from Russia, I think. I think. Um, so you can't cut off those supplies, um, but iron ore, iron ore you can do, um, because weirdly Germany doesn't have the, couldn't, could only meet about half of its iron ore requirements pre-war. Um, anyway, so that's good. There's some bad, not so good. So by the time this is agreed it's the 28th of March so that winter period when the um, Lulia is going to be iced up is nearly over so are you actually going to be driving any significant number of ships into the North Sea to hunt down and kill not really also, Norway is a neutral country and you are planning on laying mines in their territorial waters. There was also a third part of this, which had been that the, these ideas of intervening in Norway had partly been associated with or using even a, or even using a cover of going to help the Finns. And the best access point seemed to be going into Narvik and then trying to kind of cut across. Um, and yeah, but actually part of the idea behind intervening there was to cut off these iron ore supplies. It, it's all a bit odd, if I'm honest. I don't, I don't fully understand this plan. One thing is it had apparently been a an exceptionally cold winter, which is one of the reasons why there were delays in the Germans invading um, France and the, the Low Countries. Um, so people may have just been going a bit stir crazy. I don't, I don't really understand all of the 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 the, the thinkings around all of this, but never mind. We are where we are. It was an option to try and get something happening without having to sneak round the Maginot line, I guess. Anyway, uh, so we're going to kind of more about the point of divergence. So uh, the Admiralty were aware, well, 
the Admiralty are aware that this plan, Wilfred, is provocative and is going to get a is likely to get a response from the Germans. So my point of divergence starts around 28th, 29th of March with them not doing some things which I consider rather foolish. So this is our kind of point of divergence. This is your warning. And I've been playing with the PowerPoint things, so, you know. So we're not going to send Warspite to the Mediterranean. She was sent uh, on the 4th of April. Yeah, so that's not happening. We've got three, OK, elderly, but all with uh, eight 15 inch guns. Uh, we've got three elderly battleships um, in the Atlantic acting as escorts, which we're going to say, why don't you just kind of just around the time we're doing this, why don't you hang around on the kind of more British side of the Atlantic rather than pootling back to Halifax? Just just in case we need you, you know, you can still be kind of doing long range cover of the convoys and things. But, um, you know, if we need you, you're there. Uh, we've got Resolution. Um, she's due to finish a refit in uh, Devonport any time now. Uh, so she's one of the. I've only bent things by a literal day or two in terms of getting ships uh, back from refits. Uh, on the grounds that if it's only the last day or two and they're fairly short refits, you probably can speed it up at the expense of maybe not working on the ships which are having the really long refits. Because uh, some ships are... Uh, so HMS Hood at this point is in the middle of having her... Um, uh, what are they called? Something horribly invasive done to her turbines to try and actually gain some power um, so it's a very involved job that was going to take 45 days at least um, so she's only recently entered that um, as an example so I can't do anything with her she's she's not an option so you know I've gone through the cruisers and capital ships of the navy and if anyone's interested I can do something about where they all were around now because I have a list but you know We'll, we'll we'll get to that. Uh, so, yeah, we now have uh, five extra battleships available to us. Um, bearing in mind that at the time, the force, the home fleet comprised two battleships, which were Rodney and Valiant, and two battlecruisers, Renown and Repulse. Yeah, so we've just more than doubled our forces by not being an idiot and really no one's going to know about this you know remember mediterranean we're not at war with italy yet we're, we're, we're like over two months away from that three months two three months away from that um the convoy escorts there are no surface raiders about the germans don't have anything out at the moment so actually shifting the battleships those battleships more towards the GI UK gap and things to, to block any sort of escape from the North Sea into the Atlantic is actually a better use of them. Um, and it's worth saying the cruisers, the Royal Navy's cruisers, are stretched tight as a drumskin at this point. I mean, you know, I was going through and the Royal Navy's got, what, 50, 60 cruisers at this point. I was going through where they where they're all deployed, what they're all up to, da 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 da, trying to find more to scrape up in the way that I did these major war these more major war these capital ships. I found three, three that weren't deployed a long way away, doing important things, reminding people that Britain existed. That is reminding the Italians and the Japanese mainly at that point, this point. Um, or protecting trade in far off places. 
from U-boats and other things and just doing stuff or being repaired after being damaged um, in fighting during the phony war. Anyway, other thing, things. So Ark Royal in late March gets sent off to the Mediterranean to go and do workup exercises because they both just had refits uh, in the Mediterranean which I'm sure is really lovely. The Mediterranean in late March, early April is a gorgeous place to be. And um, Glorious actually was having her refit in Malta. But they're going to come home. They're going to come home from late March. These are fast ships. They are going to apply pedal to metal. After all, they've just had a refit. Think of it as a shakedown cruise. So they, they can zoom and they can do the distance in four or five days. They can get to Scarpa Flow, so they can be in Scarpa Flow and have a little bit of time to settle and refuel. Um, you know, to to be ready for operations because we are initially thinking we're going to have a go date of the fifth, but now it's the eighth. So you know, we want our forces just concentrated. We just want them around and available. Then they can all go off and do other things once we know what we're dealing with but that's not what's happening here um now this is annoying so furious was just finishing a refit at devonport at about the same time as resolution so they can travel together in real life history the admiral of the home fleet appears to have forgotten he had furious available for over 24 hours and Furious only left Scarpa Flow because she was ordered to coming from the Admiralty, not from the guy in charge of the home fleet at sea. A little bit of an error. Equally, what on earth was the Admiral in charge of aircraft carriers um, thinking or doing staying in harbour? Why didn't he just go, sod this for a game of soldiers? I'm out of here. There are there are Germans to be sunk. Um, I have mighty swordfish. Um, and this time they might remember to leave with their full air complement, which apparently they didn't. I mean, just. Um, this is the same admiral who let Glorious go pretty much solo when. And get sunk. A month or two later so yeah um what else have we got we've got argus and pegasus now they're uh seaplane carriers or auxiliary carriers but what are they going to be good for patrolling because they can put up slow but long range aircraft like supermarine walruses and they can act as ferries for um the uh to get fighters once you've got land bases. So they can either be helping to hunt for the Germans, once you know they're at sea, or they can be helping with other stuff. They can help to cover these gaps, the GI UK gap, the other gaps, by forward deploying your aircraft, even if the weather's a bit crap. I mean, they can probably land on, I, you know. This is Pegasus that was Ark Royal before Ark Royal became Ark Royal, and Argus is there going, I was the first aircraft carrier in my day we didn't have these monoplane things coal power um actually it probably would have really liked to have some string bags on it would remind it of home although i will remind everyone the fairy swordfish might have looked old-fashioned was actually reasonably modern when it you know, it was not that old a design. It was a 1930s design, not a, you know, holdover from World War One. Just had a lot of the same appearances because they wanted slow and endurance and good weight, you know, carrying capacity. So they sacrificed speed. You want lift and you don't care about speed? Stick two wing sets of wings on. Um, you know, ain't broke, don't fix it. They've been making aircraft like that for ages. Anyway, I'm I'm getting distracted. Um, yeah, and these are the cruisers I can scrape up. So Suffolk, Effingham and Enterprise uh, all come out of refit in real life um, not long after the 
start of the battle. So again, I can speed them up by a day or two. Um, and these are in big ports um, or dockyards rather. So there should be the resources to kind of do a rush job getting them ready. Um, but that's that's not bad, I think, personally. So uh, yeah. Now the other key thing is that the Royal Navy are going to pay attention to the intelligence that's coming in. Really? They are. Um, so, uh, what's happening? So, on the 5th of April, uh, 4th and 5th of April, you've got a few things happening. You've got a slow convoy heading out to Bergen from the Clyde. Um, it's expected to take, these are taking about five or six days to, to do the crossing. Uh, it's got an escort of four destroyers and then a close support force of two town class cruisers and Calcutta, which is a an old World War One vintage C class, but has been adapted as a, a anti aircraft cruiser. Um, you've also got the start of the collection of forces for um, Plan R four, Rupert. Um, and I'm going to concentrate on the naval things for this, um, but you're looking at uh, four cruisers acting as fast transports, which is something the Germans will also use. So that's Devonshire, Berwick, York and Glasgow. Um, and then you've got additional forces which are going to be on troop ships and transports with supplies and things, and they've got quite a big heavy escort force for that which uh, includes Aurora, which is one of the Arethusa -like, class light -like cruisers, um, eight tribal class destroyers, and five of the letters, letter destroyer classes. Um, now, technically, uh, Arethusa and Galatea, which are there, are not part of that, but they are in the Clyde, having just got in with uh, gaggle of destroyers t from a convoy that was going from Narvik to the Clyde that had got in on about the 7th. So so they will be available when, when things kick off. Um, should we need them? They are they are kind of part of all of this. And so I'm just lumping them in because they're part of the forces on the Clyde, frankly. Um, and then on the 5th and 6th of April, you've got the forces for Op Wilfred going through. So Going up to the north, you've got um, uh, Wilfred V, which is for Vestfjord. Uh, so that's got uh, four mine laying destroyers. Uh, so that's Esk, Impulsive, Icarus and Ivanhoe. So they get, they can carry 40 mines each, but to cope with the weight, they have to leave behind at the sh um, dockyard uh, their torpedo tubes and two of their guns just on, as a weight based thing. So they're down to just two guns, no to two, two of their 4.7 inch guns and no torpedoes. So they're they're kind of vulnerable to, to those sorts of things. And of course, they've got these standard. Almost non-existent British dis early war destroyer AA fit. Um, so they're actually escorted by four H class destroyers. Which are fully armed with their torpedoes uh, and you know four, so four 4.7 inch guns and two I think the H class have got quintuple uh, torpedo launchers but I could be wrong on that which had been tested on Glow One. You've then got a second force going up there to um, Vestfjord which is built around Renown so you've got Renown with four escorts Greyhound, Glowworm, Hyperion and Hero. Um, there are asterisks next to them for reasons and to remind me to come back to stuff. Then going south, you've got uh, WS, which is Teviot Bank, which is an auxiliary mine layer. So it's uh, she's a she's been commissioned, but she was a transport uh, commercial ship, a uh, ship taken up from trade and converted into a mine layer. So she can carry a lot of torpedo, a lot of mines. But is only capable of about like 12 knots, I think. Um, then you've got four other destroyers around. 
Now, I can't find a proper reference, or at least all the references I could find disagree. These are Inglefield, Ilex, Imogen and Isis. So they're the I class, which are one of the types of destroyers that can be uh, that are kind of fitted for the uh, mine laying, like the ones for Whiskey Victor. Um, but I can't find out whether they actually were carrying mines or whether they were carrying their normal gun and torpedo armament. I don't know. Um, now, Whiskey Bravo, which is the kind of distraction force, that's actually going to be made up from Hyperion and Hero, who are going to detach from Renown. And actually, in history, they sail up with Renown, turn back, go and refuel, and then head back to do the mine laying thing. I mean, personally, if we're making some small changes, I'm going to make sure they leave in the first place with full fuel bunkers. So they don't have to skip back to. I mean, that was just painful. It just feels like a waste of time. Um, and then also at sea and ordered north to go and join in are Birmingham, is HMS Birmingham, who together with HMS Fearless and Hostile, they've been at sea since the 31st of March down, I think, further south in the North Sea, um, hunting for uh, German fishing boats to annoy i think um and they've been ordered north to provide cover for these more southerly uh uh forces the ws and wb um renown's been sent to cover the Vestfjord stuff up at narvik um because the british intelligence suggests that um all four of the Norwegian kind of, okay, they're old, but they are not useless. Um, Norwegian coastal defence ships are up there. And so the the plan is to have something that will just totally overwhelm them. Um, plus, uh, Renown, having had a recent refit, actually has radar. She's one of the handful of ships that has radar. The, this is going to be a key thing moving forward, although not actually necessarily featuring in the video because my plan is to pause this or stop this 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 video will take us up to the point where i think things start to get interesting and then i want feedback from people about where we go from there and i'm conscious of quite how much of your time i've taken up to get to the point of telling you that but you know sorry please forgive um so we've also got uh a different home fleet uh, based at Scarpa Flow. Um, so we've got uh, the, 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 the bonus ships we didn't have before are in purple because that's my kind of point of divergence color. It's either pink or purple, I, you know, just change. <laughs> uh, it stands out. Uh, and we've got those three cruisers. Um, now we'll come on to those sorts of things. Uh, so, Rodney is our flagship. She's got radar. Um, she also has somebody who forgets that they have an aircraft carrier available command in charge, but never mind. Valiant's got radar. Um, remember, Valiant has had the same uh, upgrades as um, Warspite. In fact, they've had she's had them slightly later than Warspite, so they might even be be even better. Um, the problem is Valiant, uh, I don't know, the writers didn't like her so much. Um, she got done in by the Italian frogman. Um, so, yeah, we've got Rodney, Valiant, Warspite, who obviously has plot armour and this fearsome swordfish seaplane. Terror of the U-boats. Um, and you've got Resolution there now, who is sitting there hoping that the gods of plot balance don't want anyone to be sacrificed, I think, because she's like the the weakest of them, because she's not been particularly upgraded. You've got up Royal, you've got Arc Royal, 
You've got Glorious, who's kind of hoping things will go differently a bit in the future. You've got Furious, hoping to be remembered and used for more than just air, just as a transport. Argus and Pegasus, who wants to remind everyone that once upon a time she was Ark Royal and can do good things too. And you've got the three cruisers who are there going, oh, what are we going to have to do now? Because all the cruisers are knackered because they are being worked um, tirelessly doing things. Because remember, the Royal Navy had wanted 70. And they got 50. Ish. Never mind. Uh, with the um, treaties. So, uh, oh, there's also Repulse, who's there wishing she had more armour. Yeah. Um, and hoping that no one looks too badly at her, because uh, if you think Hood has weak armour, Repulse really has weak armour and hasn't had all the upgrades of Renown. Uh, did I have anything else on this? So, um human factors and kind of intelligence and things uh this is this is more of the changes um as it were so intelligence reports had been coming in that there was lots of german activity german naval activity in the baltic and north sea ports amphibious operations exercises were under being undertaken and major fleet units seemed to be on the move there were rumors circulating around uh kind of northern europe about attacks by Germany into Scandinavia. These were in no small part helped by the fact that um, one of the top people in the um, German intelligence service, the Abwehr, um, was blatantly and literally just telling the Danes and the Norwegians that this is what was gonna happen because he was an anti-Nazi like his boss, Admiral, like his boss. Um, Got to love the way that the Nazis were, well, the Germans were kind of sinking, trying to sink themselves. Um, so those are all going on um, to the point where people almost aren't believing it because there's too much information going on. And then there's Quisling and a few other people filtering in some or And so Quisling, there are about two figures who vaguely seem to support and agree with him who were of any relevance to this. And they may have been the only two in the entire country country of Norway from what I can tell but one of them was the deputy chief of mission in the Norwegian Berlin embassy so unfortunately the messages from this um, German anti-Nazi pass through him and so he fudges them and actually tries to obfuscate 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 and um Another one is actually the, the commander of the garrison at Narvik. Uh, those are the only two who seem to be of any significance um, to what's going to happen. Um, there's something else weird, which is that U-boat activity has been significantly diminished uh, from early March. This was part of uh, Dönitz's plan to have all the U-boats ready to support operate the operations. Um, so it's gone oddly quiet because they've just stopped sending them out. So as they come in, they're going into refit and then being held on standby. And aerial reconnaissance around Wil Wilhelmshaven and some other places has shown Scharnhorst and Eisenau, Hipper, Scheer, a couple of Königsberg class cruisers, um, some other things. And they've all been seen on the 6th, along with a lot of abnormally high levels of activity so you know lights are on well into the evenings loading ships doing stuff um and in real history this information wasn't looked at at the admiralty until lunchtime on the 7th this is reconnaissance from the 6th now i need to make a caveat which is i don't know enough about the personalities of the key figures in the Admiralty to know what's going to be a realistic change. I'm, I'm going to have a stab at it vaguely, but I could be totally wrong about these personalities. Um, and I'm just very conscious of that and that I've not managed to find out a huge amount about these people. 
So 6.37 in the morning. So the 7th of April is really the crux time. So reports are heard that German warships might be at sea. Um, this doesn't seem to be taken seriously in real life. Now it is. 8.48, an RAF aircraft reports citing at least a cruiser and six destroyers escorted by German aircraft. So they can't get a good good, good view of what's going on because they're chased off by the escort. That's 8.48. This should be starting to make things go. Mm, mm, mm. Why are you sending out these German destroyers? Why are destroyers going out? German destroyers are not necessarily going to be part. Then you, you, German destroyers, you can't take them out into the Atlantic. They just don't have the range. But you might use them to escort a surface raider that was going out, a cruiser. Bear in mind the Germans have already put out at least two of their crew, two of their Panzerschief, we're not calling them pocket battleships, um, already in the war. And so that could be that. Um, but we don't know. We don't know what's what's been sent out because our aircraft got chased off by fighters. Then at either one o'clock or two o'clock, it totally depends on whether you look at the British timings or the German timings. And people don't really seem to recognise that the two are different, which is frustrating, but never mind. Um, they, uh, the RAF sends a 107 Squadron with a load of Blenheims to attack these German warships. And the key thing about that is that they spot that there are battleships there. Now, worth bearing in mind, the at this point, the German. So I know that there's the thing about Prinz Eugen and Bismarck being mistaken for one another because they're both at range. They are both big ships um, with two twin turrets forward and aft. That's not what you're dealing with here. So at this stage, you've got um, you've got Admiral Hipper, which is same class as Prince Eugen. So she's got um, two twin eight inch turrets fore and aft. You've got Admiral Scheer, which is a uh, Panzerschief, Deutschland class Panzerschief. So she's got just a four and an aft triple 11 inch turret. You've got the Konigsberg class light cruisers and things. They've got one turret forward and I think two aft and they've only got six inch guns. They really are, I think, Didier. Um, and then you've got the Scharnhorst class battleships. Now they are um, uh, two turret, two triple turrets forward and one aft with the 11 inch guns. So these ships aren't going to look particularly similar if you're actually getting close enough to be thinking about dropping bombs on them and things. So you're not going to get that same error. Um, so uh, that's that's key uh, and that should be acted on. Also at two o'clock uh, in the afternoon Blucher is spotted off Gedser which is uh, the most southerly point on one of the big islands in uh, Denmark so you, it's on the big island you kind of have to go one side of or the other if you're going to head into the Baltic head out of the Baltic into the North Sea uh, southernmost point so you're either going to then cut up around Jutland and go into um, the North Sea that way or you're going to if you're German you're going to head to the Kiel Canal you're going to head to Kiel go through the Kiel Canal and get into the North Sea that way um, so the big Fear. Fear may not be the right word. The big thing for the Royal Navy at this sort of stage is um, the idea of large surface raiders getting out. Um, this could be a kind of capital ship fixation on other capital ships. Um, it could be they just want the sport of tracking them down and killing them. Um, whatever. That is their focus. That is the Navy's focus they you know if you can eliminate the german capital ship threat which at the moment is just the scharnhorst and the nice now then suddenly you don't really need to keep your battleships at home anymore to to bottle them up you can send them elsewhere but whilst they're there 
you've got to be able to block off all their options and you've currently got slower significantly slower battleships so you've got to be kind of at least halfway towards being pre positioned so you've got to have more of them because you're going to have to block the the different exits um this is why hood and um prince of wales get sent out after the bismarck it's not because they're the best available it's because they're the fastest available who actually stand a chance of catching them you, you know war spike is eight knots slower probably uh, maybe slightly less seven knots slower than than bismarck at top speed you know and and shanhos and nice now are pretty fast short-legged not necessarily very reliable not well built but you know they're fast um so so this is this these are the issues this is why you want to get rid of them anyway um so moving on to human factors who have we got we've got first sea lord admiral of the fleet i think at this stage dudley pound i must confess i'm not a big fan i haven't read it much in the way of biography um uh apparently he's away for the day i think possibly with churchill actually um on the south coast or something he's out of london it is a sunday he's out of london he is away for the whole day and potentially off fishing or something so is incommunicado because these are pre-mobile phone days uh so deputy chief of naval staff is vice admiral tom phillips now he's the one who's famous for um being killed sadly um with prince of wales and repulse uh in december 41 but at this point he is the deputy chief of the naval staff so number two to dudley pound if ish in terms of these sorts of operational matters he's aware of all this intelligence he actually in history i want to say canonically but really that's the kind of thing you do if you're writing fanfic so sorry uh so he he actually wrote briefing papers for churchill and pound about all of this um in the days leading up to it so he was aware of all of this reportedly when he was hearing this intelligence he thought it was all a bluff um but never mind uh in this case he's not so he's aware of the intelligence he's another notable trait about this guy is he is he is noted for his attention to detail so he wrote a he assessed the first report into the sinking of hms hood and said basically this is rubbish and got them to do another one um, to look into it because he just recognized that the one that was produced was just rubbish so again you know that attention to detail picking picking things up um then ooh, not quite sure what's happening there sorry uh notice for attention to detail so he's going to take action you know he's pretty decisive pays attention to detail not afraid of doing something when it needs to be done so what's he going to do he's going to inform admiral forbes so this is going to be by one two o'clock he's informing the commander-in-chief of the home fleet who and he'll phrase it politely but basically the the order is going to be you know you've been kind of aware of this stuff happening that's why we've collected the big home fleet together um get out there get out there go go hopefully you'll reasonably up to you know you can raise steam fairly quickly uh tells rear admiral whitworth who is commanding the forces at sea at the moment conducting the mining operations from renown tell him what's going on uh ask the raf to basically if it flies and has a radio and or a camera can we have it up in the air covering the north sea and looking at things and german ports and stuff like that um then there are about 19 or 20 allied submarines uh that have been deployed in preparation for everything that's going to happen let them know to to be on the lookout for stuff happening because they can act as your spotters they are in position 
Um, that convoy, which I think I talked about, ON25, that's gone out for outbound from uh, the Clyde. I think it's the Clyde. One of the big Scottish rivers. Has <laughs> um, uh, headed off, um, but with quite a reasonable escort. So the it's got three cruisers and a and four destroyers. Um, at this point, we have better uses for those ships. Um, so the convoy can. <sighs> Actually, if it's a surface raider, about its best bet is actually to scatter. And so if they can get to home faster, go home. If you can get to Bergen faster, go to Bergen. But, you know, scatter so that one big ship can't find you, lots of you together and sink you all. Cruisers are always useful. Destroyers are always useful in these sorts of things. Although one of the crucial things is going to be having ships with the size, strength and endurance to sit up in the GI UK gap, which the destroyers can't. So that's where your cruisers may come in handy. That's why I'm keen to get those three cruisers. That's where I'm sending the old battleships. That's where I'd think of sending possibly some of the auxiliary carriers is closing off that with ships that are big enough to actually stay there for a while. That's where that's where they deployed a lot of the armed merchant cruisers. Um, which is what I've just said. Um, so the armed merchant cruisers were what were doing a lot of that patrolling when the threats weren't too big um, because they're big cruise liners, they're quite fast and they're big. Damage control wise and things, gunnery wise, but they're just there as eyes. Eyes on a ship big enough to actually survive out there. So what does all this mean? It means the home fleet sorting earlier. Um, and we're talking about a time when a few hours make a difference. So and you've got more forces now as well. This is the reason we're going back a bit further. Uh, you know, a whole like just over a week. Um, so we've now got enough ships that we can close the GI UK gap. We can try and close the get a get across the um, Bergen Shetland Islands narrow point of the North Sea before the Germans get there. Um, and and have a force that can actually go out into the North Sea and try and hunt down the Germans and sink them. So you can actually do all three things. They they couldn't do that with the forces they had before in, in real history, which was part of the problem. And that was why they shifted the home fleet, went north, and so wasn't available to help interdict the invasion forces um, because they were too busy concentrating on trying to prevent a capital ship or major surface unit breakout uh, into the Atlantic. Um, but now suddenly we can, and we've got air, lots of aircraft carriers to do reconnaissance. We've got a handful of cruisers, um, but those cruisers can be backed up by battleships, um, slow battleships, but equally, you know, we can draw the Germans onto them. That's the crucial thing. You know, we can use our cruisers to, 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 to get ahead of them. We've got the numbers. We can get numbers on them, even if they can outpace us. We can short, do shortcuts. We can also try and do things like send swordfish after them to try and knock holes in them and slow them down. So, uh, oh, not quite sure what had happened with this. I clearly got my slides in the wrong order. Sorry. Um, so what are the baddies, sorry, Germans up to? Um, so I'm not really making any changes to the German side until they would get intelligence to say something else is happening. They had a very carefully detailed, precisely planned and coordinated operation relying on surprise and simultaneous things happening. They had, um, broadly speaking, good, competent commanders. Um, I note that one of these two is a convicted war criminal. I'm 
you know, I'm saying they're good, competent commanders of for for a battle, not necessarily nice people or um, good human beings. So you've got Van von Falkenhorst, who had planned the whole thing and been in charge of it. Uh, it was all slightly odd. He kind of, uh, yeah, somewhat odd operation. Essentially, the forces for this um, were completely separate from the ones that were being planned to be used in the invasion of France and the Low Countries. So the two things were kind of separated. What that meant was that he got much less in the way of paratroopers and glider-borne units assigned to him because they were a very finite resource. Um, and he only had about six divisions of troops, I think. But, so he's in charge, he's come up with the plan, and then you've got Gunther Lutjens um, commanding the naval forces. This is the guy who... Um, now him I've actually dug into a bit more because he commanded the bit he was the admiral on the Bismarck when she um went on operation uh uh Rhine thingy, Rhinobung. Rhinobung? Uh this 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 operation is called uh Vesa Hubung. Uh Weser. Uh, so the Ve river Vesa is a is a one of the major rivers in Germany. And it's Unternehmen Weserhubung, I think. I probably just butchered that. Um, but yeah, Luchens uh, seems to have been not a Nazi. Um, appears to have criticised Hitler to his face uh, for things like anti-Semitism, which I'm quite impressed by. Um, and was a pretty good naval commander. Uh, just dealt a rubbish hand because you're the Kriegsmarine. You are sucking hind teat um, in terms of access to resources. But, you know. So uh, the plan relied on surprise. So actually some of the forces had actually set out as early as the 3rd of April. Uh these were slow troop transports and things headed off, um, just looking like normal merchant shipping. The warships, the first of those all departs on the 6th and 7th. This isn't counting U-Bota. Uh, U-Bota? Again, we're going to ignore my butchering of those. So you've, but you've got collected together a pretty impressive main force that is set out on the night of the 6th, 7th of April. This is what we're going to be looking at. So that comprises Scharnhorst, Neisnau, which is Lutjens's um, flagship, Admiral Hipper, which is an Admiral Hipper class cruiser, unsurprisingly. And then they've got 14 destroyers. Um, now everything except the battleships is carry is is packed the gunnels with troops to the point where in a description of the Admiral Hipper I was reading the crews all had to be at action stations and stayed at action stations, not just because it was a scary sortie and everything, but also because everywhere else was full of soldiers. So all the accommodation was just chock full of soldiers. Um, and these were the forces for um, Narvik and other place. Sorry, when I'm recording this, my little face is hiding my note. Tron time, I think. Um, so, what's going to happen next uh, with all of this? The fleets are at sea. Things are different. The Royal Navy has sorted many hours earlier. They are aware of what's going on and they have more resources. But the Germans have a cunning plan. What's going to happen next? You tell me. This is the fun part. This is where we now get to stop and think about our counterfactuals. What's going to happen? Where's there going to be a naval battle? We've got details. We know how fast the German fleet moved that night, that day and night. Um, we know that the weather 
particularly further in the more northerly bits of the North Sea, um, got really bad on the afternoon of the 7th. So visibility dropped and the sea state got really bad. Um, but what does this all mean? I want some feedback and then we can potentially run through ideas for this. Um, I want input, please. Because <laughs> my worry is that with a counterfactual like this, if I'm there thinking, you know, putting myself in the shoes of one of the British admirals or something, I'm not going to think straight as the German. It's like, if I, I can't play chess against myself. I can't play chess at all, to be perfectly honest. I can't even play um, noughts and crosses against myself, but, you know. So, input appreciated. Um, yeah, thank you very much.